everyone. Thanks for joining me today. Um, I'm Steph Wanick at ESU8. Um, I'm a staff developer here, and today we're going to be um, talking about Marzano's six-step vocabulary instruction. Thanks for joining me, Joy and Sharon. Um, Dr. Robert Marzano is um, a leading educational researcher in the country, and he's done a lot of work on vocabulary. Uh, if we had more time, I would definitely click on this picture and we would watch um, a video, but um, I will attach my um, presentation to um, the webinar link online, and if you want to go back and hear him talk a little bit about vocabulary later, that would be great, but he has some great insight, and hopefully we'll hit most of his um, main points as we go on today. So we know that our kids come with vocabulary gaps to school. There's actually a 30 million word gap um, uh, by the time our, eight, our kids are three years old. So children from professional homes have heard 45 million words by age three. Children from working class homes have heard 26 million words by age three. And children from welfare homes have heard 13 million words by age three. So we see that that's about a 30 million word gap and so we can see right there that um, definitely our kids are coming to us from different places, different homes, different backgrounds and that affects their vocabulary. So why should we teach vocabulary? Well when all teachers in a school focus on the same academic vocabulary and teach in the same way, uh, the school has a powerful comprehensive approach. Um, you know, you think about it, no matter what we do, if we're systemic in it, if we teach the same reading program all the way through, um, spelling program, math program, we know that our kids um, have more continuity if, uh, and it helps them learn. And so the same is true with vocabulary. Um, also, when all teachers in a district embrace and use the same comprehensive approach, it becomes even more powerful. So most of us, we have one elementary in our district, and so, or one one junior high and one high school. But when we think about district wide, so maybe even going and using the same system from kindergarten through twelfth grade, this can help students. Um. So when all teachers in a school focus on the same academic vocabulary and teach in the same way, a school has a powerful comprehensive approach. Oh. Um, sorry there, didn't advance my slide. There we go, sorry. Okay, um, the impact of direct vocabulary instruction. So research shows uh, a student in the 50th percentile in terms of ability to comprehend the subject matter taught in school with no direct vocabulary instruction scores in the 50th percentile ranking. Okay. So later, they're just going to stay the same. They're going to keep on being that middle level 50th percentile. But the same student after specific content area terms have been taught in a specific way raises his or her comprehension ability to the 83rd percentile. Now, when we look at that, and, and you know, we're so trained to look at our data and our, our test scores anymore, and we think that a kid could make that kind of growth from 50th to 83rd percentile. Um, I think that's pretty motivating um, as a reason to why we want to teach um, vocabulary directly. So consider this. Background knowledge is more important to understanding um, reading than IQ. Okay, We know we have those kids that have been places and seen things, but maybe they're not the best reader, but boy, they have great comprehension. Okay. We know that those kids make all the connections based on their background. And so isn't that amazing? Background knowledge is more important than IQ for reading. Vocabulary instruction in specific content area terms builds up students' background knowledge in content area. So when you give them vocabulary instruction, that's giving them vo um, background knowledge on that topic. It, it adds to their schema. Students who understand content, for example, 
in a state in a state mathematics standards document regarding data analysis and statistics have understanding of terms such as mean, media, mode, etc. Okay, so we need for not just for testing, but for the kids' whole life and for their reading comprehension, and and that they know in every subject area the key vocabulary terms and can understand those when they do get to an achievement test. So systematic instruction in vocabulary benefits all students. Okay, we know this and um, you know, our high kids can get higher. You know, our, our, our lower students can gain that vocabulary that they really need for their life. So true or false on these points? True or false? Reading 14 minutes a day means reading over 1 million words a year. Preschool or children's books expose you to more challenging vocabulary than do some primetime adult TV shows. Vocabulary can be learned through reading and talking. What do we see? Does anyone want to chat in a, a thought? True or false to one, two, and three? What do you think? Well, I'm not seeing the responses, so I'll just say right now, they are all true. Those are all true facts there. Um, and I think it's pretty daunting when you look at some of those numbers that a million words a year if a kid reads 14 minutes a day. You know, we think about that 30 um, million word gap, and maybe that's the way to start getting them um, some of those words caught up. Uh, also, to know that our books are exposing them to great vocabulary, better than TV for sure. Um, and... Uh, that we know we can learn vocabulary through reading and talking, okay, but is that enough? Is it just enough to read at home, silent reading time, or reading to a parent, and talking? Sorry, my slides are not advancing, guys, so I'm just, there we go. So what's that all mean to us? That it is not necessary for all vocabulary terms to be directly taught. Yet, direct instruction of vocabulary has been proven to make an impact. We have to choose which words we're going to teach. Some, some words kids will just pick up on their own, yet some are going to need that direct instruction. So we have these tiers of vocabulary. These are from um, a great author named Isabel Beck. If anybody would like to read her um, very kind of small vocabulary book, um, words their way. Um, I have extra copies here at the ESU and be, I would be happy to lend them out to you. You could just go ahead and shoot me an email. But she talks about the tiers of vocabulary. So um, tier one is those everyday words. They're familiar to most students. They're primarily learned from conversation. Um, hat, coat, chair, lights, those kinds of things. They're, they're words that kids know before they get to school. We don't have to teach those words. Tier 2 words are high utility words found in many cross-curricular texts. Um, maybe words like available. We could use the word available in many different contexts, many different um, uh, subject areas. They'll use it throughout their life. Um, but maybe a young child wouldn't know what that word meant. Maybe also the word interest, because interest is a multiple meaning word. Kids might not know all of the meanings for interest, and they might have to be taught them in, say, a finance class um, or a math class, and um, also maybe in the context of, of library books and that you want to pick a book of interest. So um, that would be uh, tier two, where you can have. Um, the, the word can be used across many different subject areas. Um, and tier three words are content specific words. When I think tier three, I think my science and social studies textbook where they have bolded words um, and those words are off, oftentimes heavily scaffolded right in the text where they, the kids can use context clues to find the meaning to that word right in their textbook. So we need to consider those tiers as we um, 
teach vocabulary. So how do we create a list of academic vocabulary terms? Well, Marzano uh, co-wrote this book, Building Academic Vocabulary, a Teacher's Manual. I do have a copy of that also around here. If you'd ever want to uh, take a look at it, I could loan it out. Um, in this book, um, there's um, that almost 8,000 terms in 11 subject areas that were taken from national standards documents and they're organized into grade level intervals at K2, 3, 5, uh, 6 through 8, and 9 through 12. Um, it, has, it has a list of 805 subject specific vocabulary words. And actually, this is a link here. When, you, um, when this webinar is over, you can go ahead and click that link, and it'll actually take you to that list. But it does list them out into subject areas for you. Um, so that's a really good starting place um, for that academic vocabulary. These are more of your tier three words. And um, I think that you would also want to consult your own textbooks and your own resources that you're using with your students um, currently. And then we don't want to forget those high utility words. So those tier two words. Um, and actually, Marzano has written um, two recent books, uh, Vocabulary for the Common Core and Vocabulary for the New Science Standards. That's also the Next Generation Science Standards. Um, and what he did is he went through those books, and they actually found the cognitive verbs or the cross-cutting verbs, the verbs um, that will be used in different uh, subject areas and things. Um, and you know, our, I know we're not a Common Core state, but we're so closely aligned that teaching some of those verbs would be very beneficial to our students also. And I went ahead and linked those online lists of words, as well as there's links to the books here for you. Um, so we need our Tier 3 content area words, and we need our Tier 2 high utility words in our word list for our students to be learning every year. So then we have decision making. When you decide what words do my kids need to know in a year, you need to decide on a number of words to be taught directly at each grade level. Marzano's suggestion is 150 vocabulary words total per year. That means if you have five curricular areas that you're teaching those words in, um, you might just teach. Um, 30 words per subject per year, or one word per week. Now recently I've been working with some teachers on this model and they think that their kids need and can learn more. So you have to, um, you have to make a decision there. Just know that um, this Marzano's model is based on research. So you know if you're going to start out, you might even want to start smaller and stick to that 150 and make sure that your students can learn that. So then we have to pick our terms. You ask yourself, is this term critically important to the content I will be teaching this year? Is the term important across subject areas? And then you can scan through um, the level of terms and put a check mark next to any term that meets the criteria. That might be what if you're using one of his lists. If the terms you want to teach are not found in his appendix of building academic vocabulary, you can add them to your selection list. Maybe it's a vocabulary word that is used in your reading textbook, or maybe it's a different term that your, that your math textbook uses to teach a certain skill. And if that then selection list totals more than the original estimate of that, around 150, you might want to revise your plan there. Also, consider looking at the NISA vocabulary and MAP vocabulary. I have gone ahead and um, put those links in for you, so you can go ahead and go to those links later and, and check out those um, vocabulary lists and maybe even compare them to uh, Marzano's. Okay, here. So, how many terms? Well, based on the length of these lists, determine how many terms should be taught um, per week. 
So go ahead and take your list and that number and divide it by the number of weeks you have in the school year. And, you know, uh, you might want to throw out the testing weeks and, you know, a few of the shorter weeks. Um, he, you know, oftentimes it's around 32, not the full 36 weeks. Um, and kind of see how many terms you should be teaching each week. So here's the thing. From the beginning, we can understand that these lists are not cast in stone, but rather you can add and delete as necessary over time. I think that teachers are oftentimes so worried about getting it right um, that they're afraid to start. So I would say um, we're going get, to be getting into the process of teaching these words, and, and that's what matters is that you're teaching words to kids. So if making the list is a hard part, you know, just start with some words and um, go through the year and see how it goes, and then you can get your, your number set, um, you know, as, as you teach or next year after you try it out a little bit. Okay, so how do we teach these identified words? What, what does the vocabulary actual instruction look like? Well, one thing that Marzano uses is a student notebook. Um, they use the notebook from one to the next. Uh, they select terms um, from four or five subject areas. Uh, you can record the subject area in the border, uh, color code pages. Um, you can alphabetize your list. Uh, you could organize it by subject area, unit, theme, or topic. It could be almost in binder form and the kids could um, use it from subject to subject. Uh, some of the high school kids that I had talked, or the high school teachers I had talked to said, eh, our kids carrying those binders from class to class just wouldn't work. Um, and so maybe you just have um, a, a, a binder or a small notebook in the room for um, your one subject that you see the kids. That could work. In elementary, where they're always in the same room, you could have all the subjects together. And maybe you would color code those. Um, I have a link here to a bunch of his templates. Um, and also, um, I have um, a link to his notebooks that are available for purchase. He has them all printed up and made up. I think they're about $8 a piece, though. Most districts aren't willing to spend that. So you can make a lot of them on your own. And then another cool option is um, some online notebooks that they have now. And a lot of the older kids are one-to-one -one anymore and have a device in their hands all the time. Why not just have their notebook right online? And actually, with these online notebooks, they can even um, draw in them and things. We don't have a lot of time to explore that today, but I will be offering a note-taking class hopefully in the future, and we'll highlight that a little bit more. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the six steps for teaching these new terms. We're going to go ahead and watch a video. I'm going to drag my screen over here and um, get this going for you. Words, words, words. Much of what we teach in school has to be conveyed with words. In every subject in grade level, students are exposed to new vocabulary on a daily basis. Research has shown that background knowledge of academic vocabulary is one of the strongest indicators of how well students learn subject area content when they come to school. When students have had some prior experience with the term, they are much more apt to understand vocabulary words presented as part of school curriculum. Students who have not had exposure to academic vocabulary are at a disadvantage when they encounter new terms. 
These students are at a higher risk of falling behind as new vocabulary terms are introduced. And, unfortunately, over time, the gap between these students grows even larger. But what if there was a way teachers could close the gap? ASCD's Building Academic Vocabulary Program provides teachers with a proven method for enhancing students' abilities to read and understand subject matter content by building academic background knowledge. Research has shown that one of the strongest actions a teacher can take to ensure students have the vocabulary knowledge they need is to teach specific terms in a consistently effective way. Traditionally, schools approach academic vocabulary through rote memorization of word lists. But rote memorization of definitions is ineffective. To truly learn and internalize vocabulary, students need to be actively engaged in learning new vocabulary terms. The Building Academic Vocabulary Program does just that, using a six-step process based on the latest research. First, teachers begin by describing the new term, not by using a formal definition, but instead by providing a description, explanation, or example of the new term. In Step 2, students explain the new term using their own words. Step 3 broadens students' understanding by having them draw a picture representing the term. Translating words into pictures engages students' non-linguistic learning styles and helps to reinforce the term's meaning. Step 4 strengthens understanding by focusing on activities using the new vocabulary. By using the new term in other contexts, students build a deeper understanding of the term. In Step 5, students discuss the terms with each other. Discussions allow for the social aspect of learning, which adds to student understanding of words. Finally, in Step 6, students participate in vocabulary games. Games provide more exposures to the word and associate learning new words with fun activities. According to education researcher Robert Marzano, teaching academic terms using this six-step process is one of the strongest actions teachers can take to ensure students understand the content they encounter in school. ASCD's Building Academic Vocabulary Teacher's Manual outlines this six-step process in detail. In conjunction with the Building Academic Vocabulary Student Notebooks, teachers now have a proven approach to truly build vocabulary knowledge and ultimately raise their students' academic achievement. To learn more about the Building Academic Vocabulary materials, visit the ASCD online store. Okay, guys. Um, I realized that I did not um, have a slide in there that showed you an actual notebook page. So, actually, if you just go ahead and search out Marzano Vocab Notebook, um, and you can get to all the images, and holy cow, there's tons of examples. Um, here's one of them, for instance. Um, this isn't coming up so well, but. But if you look on there, the kids list the word. They circle their understanding for the word, and we'll talk about that later. Um, they put a definition, um, but it, not even a definition, more of a description. They draw a picture. They have examples and non-examples. Some of them have synonyms and antonyms. And there's a lot of different um, choices there. And that link that I showed you um, does have um, a lot of examples. So. Um, I just wanted you to get a kind of a picture in your head of what a uh, vocabulary notebook would look like. Okay, I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint here. So, bear with me here. Okay, guys, I'm trying to get back there. I'm really sorry. Okay. 
Okay, I'm on to it now. Sorry. It's been a while since I've done a webinar. Okay. Okay, can everybody see my PowerPoint again? I hope so. Okay. So, again, we have the six steps for teaching the vocabulary. The first three steps introduce and develop the initial understanding, and the last three steps shape and sharpen the understanding. Okay, um, the first three steps are essential to do regularly uh, for each word, and the last three steps um, can be done, um, you know, maybe over two weeks you do, do them each one time. Okay, and Dr. Marzano says do them more if you can, but don't feel like you have to be um, doing those last four steps every single day. All right, let's take a look at each of the steps. Step one, again, is you're going to provide a description or explanation or example of that new term. Okay, how would you describe that definition to a friend? That's what you want to tell the kids. Um, dictionary definitions don't really help us learn those words as well, but we want a description or explanation. And um, one great resource for you to use in these is called a co-build dictionary. And um, this was a new term to me recently, but it's C-O-B-U-I-L-D, co-build dictionary. And if you um, Google that, I think Collins has a really good one. And um, it actually gives words and sentences. It gives the synonyms and the antonyms and how they're used in context. So I, I highly recommend those dictionaries. Um, also for step one, when you're trying to describe um, these words, the, you know, different terms have different features. And so, you know, with people, you think about what actions do they do? What, what's required to become one? What's, what are the characteristics? And we can see that those, um, we have different categories of words there, of events. If you were trying to describe an event for the kids, um, what people were involved in that event, or what process or actions, what equipment and materials and resources were used, what, what was the setting, uh, what were the causes and consequences. So I think that this is a really nice list, and, you know, I think if I was in the classroom, I might print something like this out and have it, um, near my vocabulary words to help me out as I describe those to kids and then also to teach the kids to use maybe some of those prompts in describing their words. So then step two here is that the kids restate that explanation in their own words. Okay, um, so again use that chart from from the last slide and have that, you know, it can be a guide to them on how to explain their word. Step three, um, kids create a non-linguistic representation of the term. They draw a picture. And, you know, it can be brought up that, you know, with high school kids, they think it's babyish. And actually, um, lots of high school kids draw symbols. You know, if you think about a lot of your math terms and things, you might draw a symbol. Um, you might draw some sort of like a flow chart things like that. Um, but actually, you know, I, I will even say as an adult, these pictures really help me remember words and what they mean. Um, so I would encourage all grade levels to give it a shot with that. You could have the challenging kids that say, I can't draw, but you could model that, give examples. You can scaffold it and have them work with a partner first. Um, kids who overdraw, and, and you don't want detailed pictures here, so you might have to um, model that also or play a draw me game and see who can um, who can draw it well and then show it to the class. Also allow others to give them tips or help. Um, the kids, some kids might just copy words instead of redrawing. And you know, you talk about the power of pictures and share stories about how pictures help learn. We all start out by reading picture books because those pictures help us. Uh, also, that you might have a kid who has trouble thinking of, of pictures for words, and use your best friend Google. <laughs> Look at the, the images that come up, and you might want to screen those first to make sure that they're appropriate, uh, but um, definitely um, you could Google a word. 
Step four, students periodically do activities that help add to knowledge of vocabulary terms. And let me just go back here for a second. These were um, steps one through three. One through three, these are the ones that you're going to do every time you teach that new word. Okay? And remember, he says four through six are the ones that you're just doing sporadically, maybe one time every two weeks, hopefully more than that if you can find time. But, um, you know, just know that you can kind of pace yourself there. Um, so anyway, students are going to periodically do these activities to help add to their knowledge of that term. So what are those activities? Some of them could be to highlight a prefix, a suffix, a root, or an affix. Um, they might identify synonyms and antonyms. They could draw additional, uh, a, an additional picture or graphic. Uh, maybe they want to list related words and classify or, or classify or compare the word to another word. Um, and actually, um, Marzano says that that is just very meaningful to, cre uh, to classify and compare. Uh, write a brief uh, cautions or reminders of common confusions. Like, hey, don't confuse this with some other word. Um, complete analogies. That's what a skill that's used, I think, through their ACTs and things like that. And with ELL kits, you might even translate to another language. Okay, so step five. Um, periodically, students are asked to discuss terms with one another. Okay. You might group them and give them roles. And I think the giving of roles is the important part here. You want to make that group work as meaningful as possible. Um, one suggestion from Marzano is to have an entomology uh, expert. They look for facts about the word's origin and meaning. And you might also have a root researcher. This person identifies any roots or affixes of words and looks for other words with similar word parts. And synonym and antonym explorer, they find the synonyms and antonyms. Um, obviously, I think these are older roles for kids. If you have younger kids that you're teaching, you might have the synonym and antonym be separate. You might have someone who draws a picture. Um, uh, maybe you're going to, um, I think root researcher could still work for young kids looking for prefixes and suffixes and that kind of, or, you know, you could even add that prefix and suffix um, rule, but also to find that root in the word. We remember our Nebraska standards don't, it doesn't matter what origin that root is, just that they know that it's the root. Okay, so you could do think-pair-share activities on that. We're gonna, we're kind of running out of time here, so I'm gonna kind of breeze through these activities. You can come back and look at them later from the link. Um, also, talk a mile a minute is a lot like $25,000 pyramid. A lot of fun. And that kind of groups your words together, too. It can on a content area. And step six is periodically students are involved in games that allow them um, to play with the terms. Marzano actually wrote a book uh, called Vocabulary Games for the Classroom. Um, and so here is a link to that book, actually, and a list of some of the games. Cool thing is, is some of his word lists are right in with these games, so they would literally be able to be used right away. Again, I have a copy of this book if you need to borrow it at all. If you want to take a look, um, I'd be happy to lend it out. Um, but I think that anytime we can have games in our school day, it makes it a lot more fun for the kids and engaging, and so they really um, learn better. So then here's the unique um, feature to Marzano's vocabulary instruction, that he has uh, students keep track of their progress. You might have noticed in um, that notebook example that I shared with you, um, that the levels one, two, three, and four were listed um, on the uh, for each word, and students can kind of keep track of their knowledge. When they first encounter a word, they might say, "I'm very uncertain about the term. I really don't understand what it means." They're a level one. 
But as they gain knowledge about the word, they might circle a different number. They can go back and change it. And like he said, we all kind of like to do that, don't we? We all kind of like to make that check mark. Yeah, I know this now. Um, and so that they can finally get to that level of, I understand even more about the term than when I was taught. Okay, or I understand the term and I'm not confused about any part of what it means. Okay, and maybe in their notebook, um, they might be reviewing it one month and realize, holy cow, I've forgotten this word. They might take them back down to a level one. And that's okay. They're just keeping track of their own learning. Our favorite levels of understanding here at the ESU is from the Big Bang Theory. So are you a Sheldon? You could teach the universe on that word. Or are you a Leonard? Uh, Sheldon may be the prodigy, but I'm pretty close. Are you a Raj or Howard? Uh, I'm smart, but pretty clueless about this. Or are you a penny? I'm stuck in the elevator. So we kind of like that. You can assign numbers to each, each of those characters, and that's kind of a fun way to think of it. So the management of it all. Teach one, two, three terms per week per subject area for 30 weeks. You set aside time periodically to engage students in those vocabulary activities add into their knowledge base, and you can allow students to discuss the terms together, help them um, do those activities together, and encourage the students to add information to those notebooks. Make the notebooks accessible so that they can constantly be adding to it or looking through it. So an example of a maybe a two-week period with this program might look something like this. Okay, on Monday you might provide a schema for a new term. Um, they'll do steps one and two. Um, vocabulary game might be played on Tuesday that week. Maybe on Wednesday you're going to create a non-linguistic representation. Thursday you might do a comparison activity and Friday you play a game. And, you know, that game really does serve as a formative assessment. You can see who knows the terms, who hasn't learned the terms yet. Okay, and it's in a little bit more of an engaging, fun way than just a written test. And we see that the next week that they mix it up a little bit, too. So it doesn't have to have a strict format. A, you know, on Mondays we do this, on Tuesdays we do this. But um, I, I do see the kind of, that we're introducing words on Monday. And it doesn't have to be like that every Monday, but that's how this example goes. Okay. So, some final thoughts here. That teachers, schools, and districts that embrace a comprehensive approach of building academic vocabulary will see impressive results in classrooms and on achievement tests. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I have a resources link. It, this is a link to a Google Doc. So again, I'll have this um, the link to my um, PowerPoint listed right with the webinar. So if you go to the ESU8 homepage and click Wednesday webinars and find this link, it'll be right there for you. So you can access any of the resources. And again, please contact me with any questions. And actually, the chat box is open. So if you have any questions right now, go ahead and uh, feel free to um, ask me any questions right now. And again, thanks a lot for um, for tuning in today and you know making vocabulary a priority for your kids. <laughs>